Matthew 18, and if you stand, we're reading again a familiar passage. Your Bible's probably fallen open to that passage now, Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, and yet vital that we work our way through it slowly so that we might, as a church, properly feel and understand the weightiness of dealing with sin, even as we press on towards the holiness that God has for us. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 15, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Please be seated. In the excellent biography of Robert Chapman titled Agape Leadership, the following account is given. In the 1840s, there was a church discipline issue which involved several churches in Plymouth, England, and resulted in an acrimonious church split. This man, Robert Chapman, known for both his deep love and strong convictions of the truth, was called upon to mediate reconciliation between two of the pastors, one of whom was John Nelson Darby, a very famous pastor in the Plymouth Brethren movement. As it became clear that Darby was not willing to pursue reconciliation, Chapman and Darby had the following exchange, which for Chapman was, was very strong. Chapman says this, You should have waited longer before separating out from the church. Darby, defensively, I waited for six months, Chapman, but if it had been at Barnstaple, that was Chapman's church, we would have waited for six years. You see, this is the kind of loving, careful, gentle, patient attitude that should underlie all confrontation of sin. The church is called to grow in conformity to the image of Christ, to demonstrate the purity of the church to the watching world. Thus, sin must be confronted and dealt with, even if it means going so far as to separate ourselves from those in sin who will not repent. And yet, even as church discipline is being carried out, it must always be with loving, gentle, careful actions that have restoration as their ultimate goal. So what we'll see this morning as we continue through our passage is that Jesus is the King, who commands his church to confront and remove those who refuse to repent of sin for the purpose of purity and unity and reconciliation. Jesus is the king. He commands his church to confront and remove those who refuse to repent of sin for the purposes of purity, unity, and reconciliation. Confrontation in love and truth promotes the health of the body of Christ. Now, it is always important to understand our context. If you've been with us, you know that in chapter 18, Jesus is talking about humility. Why? Because his disciples were demonstrating a lack thereof. They come asking, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He says, you got it all wrong. You're going to have to be humble. You have to be humble to enter the kingdom. You have, to humble, you have to be humble in order to be the greatest, as it were, in the kingdom. You have to be humble to live in the kingdom. And then you have to have humility when confronting sin in the kingdom and Remember, he changes right in the middle here in Matthew 18 from kingdom to what? Church. That is the manifestation of the kingdom now, what we are living now in the church of God. So we're going to have to have humility in all things. And if we get this wrong, this whole process goes wrong. You cannot jump into Matthew 18, grab verses 15 through 20, desire to do church discipline, and not understand the heart of God behind it and your own heart, which has to be humble. Humility is how you get in the kingdom. How could you possibly confront sin in any other way? Humility is how you enter into the kingdom. How can you allow sin to remain in your life? It's arrogant. Any sin is a, is, is a shaking of your fist at God. It's rebellion against a holy God. We're, we're to be humble. How is it that we can refuse to forgive others when they repent of sin, when we confront them? How arrogant it would be to say, well, I'm confronting you in your sin. You've repented, but I will, I will not forgive you. It's, it's too much. It's too great. When Jesus forgave every sin, there's no sin too great that it cannot be forgiven. And yet no sin too small that it does not need to be repented of. Humility overweighs this entire chapter. And while we're focusing on these verses, don't forget the context. We're to be as little children even as we confront sin, that we recognize our dependence, we recognize our need, we recognize that it is only Christ's authority and not our own, and it is all his resources that we are using, not ours. Self-righteousness does not pass, should not pass through the gates, that, that narrow gate, entrance into heaven, entrance into the kingdom of God. Well, we've been discussing then the steps to confront sin. 
Because for the church to remain pure, for the church to represent the character and nature of Christ, for the church to, to truly respond properly to the sacrifice that was made for us, we have to deal with sin because we're sinners in a sinful world. And believers do sin. We have a sinful flesh that remains within us. That's really the, the whole context of this chapter as well. It's not just unbelievers who sin. We, you know, we come to Christ and then in the church there's no sin. It's just that the church deals with sin properly. It both confronts it properly, repents of it properly, forgives it properly. The world can do nothing of that. They don't recognize sin. They don't confront sin properly. They can't respond. They can't forgive. We as a church are to be radically and completely different than the world in our purity as we deal with sin properly. So we said that this was active from the very beginning. The, the command to confront sin is go to your brother and, and you make a confrontation. You've, de- you've determined it's a real sin. It's not your self-righteous expectation or some kind of legalistic standard. It's a real sin against the character and nature of God as revealed in the word. And you actively go to confront that sin. And step one, remember, is that you confront the sin individually. That's verse 15. Where it says, if your brother sins, go show him his fault in private. So you go individually. You avoid slander. So quickly, we want to tell everyone else about the sin. We want to have talked about, you talk to it about a bunch of, to a bunch of other people, rather than keeping that sin between you and the person. And remember, this is first and foremost for sins committed against you. You can confront sins that are, uh, you know, committed against a third party or, or a person is sinning in some other way. But, but first and foremost, this is a sin you're aware of, you know of it, you have the personal exposure to it, so you know the details. And you go individually telling no one else, praying that that person will respond to you. And then it's done. Imagine if no sin made it past step one. As I've been saying all through, imagine if no sin even made it to step one. We sinned and then we repented before even anyone even talked to us. But nonetheless, when it goes to step one, imagine how, how joyful it would be in a church if everyone repented when they were confronted with sin. That it was a real sin they were confronted over and they chose to repent. And in fact, the the joy is, I know that goes on here at Grace. That that sins don't make it past step one. It happens in the family and a husband confronts a wife or uh, parents confront children or even siblings talk to each other. It, It happens between families and other things. People sin and they go and they confess their sin. They repent of sin and those relationships are healed. I know that happens. But I wish it would happen every single time. I wish it would never be one sin that made it out of step one. But they do and we went to step two. Remember, that's a serious step. I mean, the verses are very serious. Jesus says, if he doesn't listen to you, that is, remember, listen is repent. Hear you, respond, repent of sin. If he doesn't listen to you, take one or two more with you. And this is legal language quoted from Deuteronomy. In the courtroom, in the Christian or biblical courtroom, you can't convict someone on the evidence of one witness, right? You can't do that even today. So what happens is you have to have two or three, or really two others at least, two or more witnesses to this circumstance. And here it says, just take one or two more. You're not gathering a group of people here. You're just taking one or two more so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be concerned or be confirmed. This is a serious step. You don't open up someone else's sin to just anybody else. You don't talk about sin to your friends or your neighbors or your family or just casually on the phone. Sin's a weighty thing. You don't gossip about it in youth group or, or amongst your friends. If you're going to open up the sphere of influence or, or who knows about this sin, you need to have thought about it carefully. You need to be able to present that this really is a sin. It needs to have mani- manifestations that are obvious so that someone who comes and is checking to see if this person has repented will know if they've repented. This can't be something you think and maybe or you're unsure. Or, no, this has to be clear. But when it is, and they will not repent, as you've worked it through, you think it through, you consider, should I wait? Should I go again? Sometimes this is a long process. But if that person will not repent, as the sin is impacting them, impacting the church, you then take one or two more with you to go. First to see if he will repent. And then if he doesn't, the implication is that they bring weightiness to the argument by urging him to repent. So it's not just one person, now it's two or three who have recognized that there's not repentance and they urge him to repent. It says, if he refuses, 17, the first part, if he refuses to listen to them, that is the two that went along with you, now three people. Well, if it then happens that this person won't respond to the two or three, then what? Well, I would say, again, there's no time frame. Jesus is just moving in broad strokes, very black and white from one step to the next. It's not a demand that every sin go all the way through church discipline process. It doesn't give us the time frame. In fact, we'll see in 2 Thessalonians, there appears to be a certain time frame, certainly in step three. It's not just one time generally. So maybe the two or three would go several times. 
They would go and wait and pray and think and work it through and then maybe go back to that person. Who knows how long? But if it is determined then that that person has not repented, they move to step three. So let me just fill out your outline just in case. Remember that we're doing that purposely so that you'll see that Jesus, as the perfect practical preacher, is, is using an argument. He's bringing biblical argument to bear. We step our way through. We don't just jump in at various places here. So the command to confront sin, go to your brother, confront your brother. The steps to confront sin, step one, confront the sin individually, avoid slander, pursue restoration, always desiring to win your brother. That's the goal, to, to bring them back into right relationship with you and God. Step two was involve witnesses. And if they will not respond after a certain period of time, you then have another decision to make. Are we going to take it to step three? Look at the seriousness, the weightiness of step three back in our text, verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, that is the witnesses that have gone, tell it to the church. Stunning. This comes like a bolt out of, out of the blue. One, the word church. Like, oh, wait, you know, where did that come from? All right. Well, it came from Matthew 16. Jesus was already laying the groundwork for the church. He says, I will build my church. We worked our way through Peter and the rock and the keys. By the way, we're going back there next week, so get ready. And we're going to revisit some of that because it's necessary. If you look at verse 18, it talks about binding and loosing. Again, that seems to just come out of the blue. Well, Jesus has already laid the groundwork. And he's laid the groundwork for his church. I'm going to build it. It's coming in the time of Christ, right? It's prospective. It began at, in Acts chapter 2 with the day of Pentecost, the apostles and prophets then, who were then lay that groundwork with Peter being the, the primary spokesman, the one who began that work, as it were, God working through him. And so it's going to happen, and Jesus is speaking to his audience here as those who will enter into the church, the vast majority of them. They will be the first church members, even though they aren't really yet. They don't, they're not indwelt by the Spirit of God. That hasn't happened yet, but that, they're going to be. And when 2,000 come to Christ and then 3,000 come to Christ, you've got a church of 5,000 people, most of them are the ones that have heard these messages. And Jesus is saying, okay, when sin happens, this is what you're going to have to do. Because he can't, po and, and he's talking about the local church. He can't possibly be talking about the church universal. I mean, tell it to the church. Okay, so tell it to every believer in the entire world. Now, these days, we do that, right? We, we throw it on Twitter. We stick it up on Facebook. It's a travesty. It's an absolute travesty when the sins of others are getting thrown around to the entire world to see. There's never that kind of space given, okay, when we're working through this kind of situation. I understand with false teachers sin and do stuff that, you know, it's reasonable to, to expand that audience. But here... When it's in a, a church, it, it has, it's contained within this uh, local body, which, by the way, is why membership is so important. Because this is not a real church if we don't know who's in it and therefore don't know who it is that we would confront in sin and who we would, as we will see, ultimately have to put out if they don't repent. That's why we have a membership process. In Acts, the membership process was baptism. But when people come to our church, they don't get baptized here because they're already believers have already been baptized. So we have a process by which people enter into the church, make a covenant with it, so that we know who we're dealing with. And when there is a sin, and it's been working its way through, step one, step two, then who do you tell it to? Everybody in the city? No, you tell it to the church. The church gathered, the local assembly. Now back then there was one church in every city. Now we've got hundreds, thousands. But this is your local church. This is where you've committed. So uh, we're working it all the way to there. Jesus is setting the stage, the groundwork for this phase of the kingdom, which will continue until the next phase when he sets it up on earth, the church. So he's setting the groundwork for that. Jesus was certainly aware and preparing. So he says, tell it to the church. Again, this is weighty. You've now taken a sin that was first exposed to one person, then exposed to a maximum of three people, and now you're exposing it to as many as 15,000 people. Think about the church in Jerusalem. Well, we don't like big churches, and Francis Chan just wrote this book about you've got to have little teeny churches. Has he been reading the Bible? I mean, there's probably 15,000 people in, at least in Jerusalem who come to Christ with one set of elders. Well, they're mega elders. I mean, they're the apostles. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to have those guys as your elders? But nonetheless, oh, this massive church, and now you're going to take this sin, and all of a sudden, 15,000 people are going to know about it. I tell you this, you had better be careful before you make that step. You had better be sure that this is really sin. That's why you've probably involved leadership already. You're going to have to at this step, before this happens, you're not going to go do this without getting the leadership involved, but you're going to have to have somebody who can, who can bear testimony. Okay, this is the real deal. This needs to go to step three. And then when you release it to the entire church, you'd best be careful. Additionally, church, you need to be careful. An immature church cannot handle church discipline. Still has to do it. That's the problem. Now, most immature churches don't do church discipline. That's one of the things that makes them immature. They don't deal with sin properly. 
But if I reveal, if we reveal, as the elders reveal a sin of someone to now, not 3,000 or 15,000, but maybe 300, 300 people now know, and you have the weight of dealing with that. If you're immature, you're going to blow it up. If you don't love people, you're going to blow it up. If you're self-righteous and arrogant and harsh and proud, you're going to blow up that whole process. And now we've just fed someone to the wolves. And we still have to do it. That's why I'm teaching you on it. It is your responsibility to be mature, to be loving, to be gracious, to be gentle, to be truthful. Because you could deal with something like this. If you can't, we've failed. And so have you. If I, we haven't taught you, we've failed. If you don't respond to it, you have failed to do this rightly all the way along. That's why we're talking about it. You have a responsibility now to do this well, and we've done it at this church. I believe five times since I've been here in 14 years. But we have done official church discipline. And by the Lord's grace, the congregation has generally responded well, but not always, and not in every case. So it needs to be done. It needs to be done well, and you need to be able to respond to it well. This reminds us, of course, that sin is not just a personal matter. It affects the entire body. That's what Jesus is making very clear and again, it affects that entire local church. We're all connected together. I was running on the green belt on Friday and uh, I was cruising along listening to an Alistair Begg sermon, not paying a lot of attention. The fall leaves were out and, and hidden, maybe carefully placed by a sovereign God, was a walnut, only about this size. On it, my ankle went pow, on the ground. I mean, blood and guts everywhere. Literally blood. This guy comes by, he's like, are you okay? I'm moaning. Oh, I'm going to be all right. You don't need to get anybody limped back to the, to the place. My ankle's about the size of a, was about the size of a pomegranate. But I didn't, you know, when I sat there on the ground hurting, it wasn't like the rest of my body was like, this is, this is a party. Sorry about the ankle, you know. Every part of me hurt. My brain is screaming, you know, every part. And, and when I wanted to get back to the church, I was on the green belt a mile away. I had to get back here early in the morning. I couldn't just, you know, rip off my ankle and leave it there. And then walk back. No, as I walk back, all of my body hurt. That pain shooting through my ankle is telling every part of me, this is not good. Sin affects every part of us. You can't just, I couldn't just take my head back. Well, let's, well leave this. It doesn't, impact, it doesn't impact the rest of me. I couldn't chop off body parts and get them back to the church. Everyone's involved when there is sin, when there is difficulty. Yes, when there is pain and hurt, we're involved. All the body hurts. When there's joy, we all rejoice. When things are well. You know, the moment before, I'm, my whole body's rejoicing and running and enjoying that, and then wham, this thing happens. But when there is sin, it's pain in the body. It's hurtful to the body. Think about cancer cells. You don't even know they're in there. Got a couple of cancerous cells, and one by one, those cells are getting killed off by the cancer. But it's like, oh, you know, doctors look at that and go, it's just a couple of cells. It's, just, it's localized. It's just killing the cells right around your lung. Well, what happens? You do that too much, and your whole body dies. It's not like, well, my lungs died. Well, you died. There's a whole thing. Sin is deadly, dangerous. It has to be dealt with. That's why you would tell it to the whole church because the whole church is now going to be called upon to try to bring that person to repentance. Sin impacts everyone in the body and it impacts those for whom Christ died for. It impacts those whom he loves. It impacts those who really are him. When you sin against someone else, you're sinning against Christ. You're dishonoring the name of Christ. You're dishonoring the work of God. You're dishonoring God the Father. You're dishonoring the Spirit of God who gives you the power not to sin. He's grieved by that. It's a grievous thing in the entire body because we're linked together by the Spirit of God in a, real, a very real way. We're linked together. Every part of the body's harmed. So now the whole body is being called to deal with the sin that's bringing harm to all of it. Even when they weren't aware of it before, it still was harming them. Again, what kinds of sin should go to step three? It's essentially the questions I asked last week. Step two, is it ongoing? Is it visible? Could you bring witnesses for it and against it? Is it to be very clear? And yet there's no particular sin. There's no specific sin that's, that's mandated for. It could be something as, as clear as adultery or incest. That's what Paul deals with in 1 Corinthians 5. Okay, that's, and once it's a private sin, nobody else knew that incest was going on at first, and it wasn't impacting anybody else well, except those two people, right? No, the whole body is being infected by that kind of view. And then people got, came to know about it, and they were coddling it. They said, it's okay for this to go on. could be something like that, but you guys, it could be anger. It could be lying. What, what God himself did in the early church in Acts chapter 5, you know, the first really church discipline done directly by God, the, the highest authority, Ionis and Ionis and Sapphira died. Why? For lying. And he's making a point. My church is to be pure. Now again, you have to be very careful to bring a sin like that before the entire body. Again, you have to be clear, have to be, you know, impact. We're not the Lord. We don't know everybody's heart. 
But nonetheless, there's no sin that can't be. It just has to be very clear, very obvious, and evident, and that can be judged by the body as being done and then being repented of if it is. And if it is that kind of sin, then it needs to come before the body. Now, the steps here, of course, first one would be inform the leadership. So step three, tell it to the church. You, the leadership has to know. If they don't already know beforehand, if you didn't involve them in step two, which they don't have to be. But in step three, you can't you know, say, hey, I'd like to you know, imagine this morning, somebody says, I got something I need to say. Walks up on stage, says, so-and-so has committed a sin, you all need to know that. And I'm like, what? No, the leadership has to know why, because they're in charge of overseeing the congregation and its spiritual welfare. So, of course, before something is brought to the entire church, they're going to have to know, have weighed in upon it, and then directed that process. First Peter 5. Therefore, says Peter, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion. It is the job of the elders to exercise spiritual oversight to see how they, not just to preach and teach but to be sure that those things are being handled properly and well that the information the truth is being established that it's being done in a biblical way that the ministries run pro- the elders are over, to oversee that it's a very strong oversight function as well as teaching and preaching and, and encouraging it, there's an oversight function as well so you would have to inform the leadership here it's fascinating in 1 Corinthians 5 Paul himself directly deals with the situation in Corinth why? We can postulate a couple of things. The elders weren't doing their jobs. Maybe two they didn't even have any elders. Who, who knows? Or they, you know, they, they repudiated them. But Paul takes direct authority, deals with the situation as an elder. Remember the apostles, as we'll see in just a minute, Peter here saying that. The apostles were also elders. They were shepherds of the church. So even in, in Corinth, and in that church discipline situation, a leader takes the direction, directs the church as to what to do. So informing the church. By the way, then how, how will the church respond? Because that's the next step. Inform the leadership, then inform the entire church. That's implied, of course, again, by that you must tell, have him tell it to the church. The church gathered, that is the local church, the church to which that, of which that person is a member who has, has covenanted. Again, in early church, that was just one church in one city, but now we've got multiple ones. So you're not, we're not going to go tell every church in town that this person sinned. It's going to be your local church. You're the member of that church. You've said you were a believer. Now that you're sinning and not repenting, so we're going to tell the whole church to come and talk with you. If he, and that's, again, implied in verse 17. In the middle part, it says, if he refuses to listen even to the church. So this isn't step four. This is sometimes confused. When the sin initially comes to the entire congregation, it's not for the purpose of setting that person out. It's for the purpose of the congregation now becoming the witnesses that the two or three already were. He didn't repent with two or three. Now the whole church is brought to bear and they are to call that person to repentance and to look to see if there is repentance. The entire church, unbelievably weighty. All these people now know that this sin is going on and are looking for repentance and calling to repentance. It's in the Bible. It's right there. And they are to be called, call them to repentance. At this step, by the way, the church is still treating that person as a believer. They claim to be, that's why you have believing membership again. You hear the testimonies, right, of everybody that comes into the church. You're making a determination as best you can, okay? We think they're a believer by testimony and lifestyle. And so since they claim to be a believer, they're part of our church, we treat them that way even when they sin. Of course when they sin. Now, in our Reformed tradition, perhaps if I might call it that, those who hold to the sovereignty of God and salvation and the things that go along with that, we have a besetting problem. And one of our besetting problems is that once we become Reformed, I've heard that almost like salvation. You, know, not, you don't become Reformed. You get saved, and then you recognize God's sovereignty in that, that we tell everybody they're not Christians. We come to Christ, and all of a sudden, everybody in our life, or, or we recognize these doctrines, all of a sudden, everybody in our life is an unbeliever, almost without exception. They don't live up to our standard. You don't understand God's sovereignty. You don't know that this is going on. And so we start telling our family members, you know, your grandma has been going to church for 80 years and you're not a Christian. Now, she might not be. I understand that. But you need to be careful before you start throwing that around. To call someone not a Christian is a really serious deal. In fact, it's so serious that it's really generally to be done by the church as a whole. They're all going to declare this person, we'll see that in step four, an unbeliever. Be careful of doing that on your own. Be careful of nobody living up to your standard. Be careful of no church in the whole city. There's no believers there. You wonder why sometimes maybe Grace Community Church or other Reformed churches are looked down upon. Because all of a sudden we're calling everybody everywhere unbelievers except us. Watch out for that. 
again, if by their testimony they tell you, they're, you know, they don't believe in Jesus or you know, they, they totally misunderstand the gospel, okay, I mean, there's, there, you can say that. But be careful of that with someone who professes Jesus and has been trying to live for Jesus and, and is wrestling and struggling or is in a bad church or even a church that doesn't go as far as we do in certain things. Be so careful. And so we, we want to remove it. That would be odious, wouldn't it? If everyone, all of a sudden, every, you know, you started calling everyone in your life an unbeliever, they're like, well, who are you? I mean, I've known you since you were a baby. I've seen you. I took you to church. And you're calling me an unbeliever? Be careful. Now, that's what is happening in this step. But look at all the things that went, happen, went through. Before that happens, in step three, you're not calling them an unbeliever. Listen, even though they've been in this pattern of sin, one person confronted them, two to three people confronted them, maybe a period of time, they still haven't repented, you're not yet calling them an unbeliever because believers get caught in serious patterns of sin. They wrestle sometimes for years with sin and we continue to deal with them graciously and kindly and we don't cut them off and say you're an unbeliever. There comes a time when that's necessary, but it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a huge thing when you do that. And so we're treating them as believers. How do I know that? You might be saying, I don't see that in the passage. We need to figure that out. So turn to 2 Thessalonians. Remember, the epistles help us flesh out what's really going on when Jesus gives these black and white, this boom, 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 here it goes. This is what you do in the church. Well, how do we work that out? Well, the apostle Paul gives us some evidence. In 2 Thessalonians 3, where there, he's dealing with unruly people in the church. There's a couple specific sins. They're being lazy. They're sponging off one another. They're not working hard. Maybe because they believe Christ is coming, possibly, and it's going to come soon, so they're just going to give up and, and wait for the church to provide for them. But when they were doing that, they were getting unruly. They were, they were then being busybodies. They were getting involved in everybody's business and then trying to get people to help them. And they weren't obeying biblical teaching was the biggest part of that. That was just one manifestation. And Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, he says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, not according to the tradition which you receive from us. He's going to talk about his personal example. But that, the idea of that tradition there is anything Paul taught, anything the apostles taught, if they weren't obeying it, believing it, and, and then weren't responding, they weren't repenting, then it says here, keep away from. I was going to define that in just a minute, but that's so far as to start to remove yourself from fellowship, even though you're still considering them to be a brother. It says every brother, verse 6. Look down at verse 14. So he, he, he clarifies this. If anyone, anyone does not obey our instruction, now he's just broadening it out. He'd been dealing with a specific situation. Now so if any brother doesn't obey our instruction in this letter, and again, that's broadened out to anything an apostle would instruct, which are it's scripture. Right, the New Testament scriptures. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person. How would you do that? That appears to be very clearly step three of church discipline. That person has now been noted. The leadership was involved in that. I think by implication, certainly. Look, here's this person. They're sinning. They haven't responded. They're not listening to our instruction. You take special note of that person because, again, it's the whole church being called to here. And do not associate with him. Wow! So you put him out of the church? No, no, not yet. That's not what this is. It says, so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. You're still calling him a Christian. He made the profession. He's sinning grievously. You're trying to deal with it, but you're still treating him as a, as a believer at this step. But notice what you aren't doing. You're not hanging out with him. After step three, what's happening is the whole church knows there's this sin. And so when you are with this person, what are you doing? You're calling them to repentance. Why? So they'll be put to shame. Can you imagine the world reading this? What is, the, what is the one thing in this world you cannot ever do? Shame anyone. You do that, they'll put you in prison. You do that, you do internet shaming, you do that kind of thing, they'll throw you in jail. They'll throw the book. I mean, you can, you can practically kill people before you can shame someone. Now again, when that's when it's done out of your arrogance and foolishness and self-righteousness and all those things, well, yeah, you shouldn't be shaming anybody. But here... They are to be put to shame. Why? Because it's a shameful thing to sin. And remember, shame has to do with what people think. That's why someone is ashamed, because everybody knows, right? If nobody knows, are you ashamed? Usually not. Now, you ought to be, because God knows, right? But you're not. You're like, ah, everything's fine, everything's cool. But when somebody knows, they're like, ooh, I feel ashamed at that. Well, that's right and good if you've been sinning. You ought to be ashamed of your sin because it's dishonoring and displeasing a holy God. And not just you, but me, certainly. There's no one, no one exempt from this. And what happens is the whole body of believers is now saying, how can you do this? 
Why aren't you repenting? You are a professing believer. You have taken hold of the sacrifice of Christ by your own profession. You have the Spirit of God living inside of you. You have the Word of God as your guide and your guard, and you are ignoring it and trampling upon the sacrifice of Christ by refusing to repent. You ought to be ashamed. That's what the church is doing. Wow. And by the way, these days people say, well, you can't do that. You can't do step. You can't do church discipline. You're going to get sued, maybe. And ever increasingly, there's laws out there now to say, I mean, if someone feels uncomfortable by something you say that's religious, they can prosecute you. Imagine this. You're actually telling them that they are to be ashamed. You're shaming them. Only, only, only biblically, only because they've sinned against the Holy God. But most importantly, it's not because they've sinned against you. It's because they've sinned against the Holy God. That's what they're ashamed of. And they're harming the church of God that Jesus died to purchase with his own blood. It is Shameful. It is the most shameful thing in the world for a believer to sin and not repent because he's trampling underfoot the sacrifice of Christ. That's what Paul is saying. So this is not a, this is, you're not encouraging this person now. Hey, how's it going? You know, just want to help you out. Imagine having, having the person who did this over for, for dinner. And what you're supposed to be doing is confronting them. So you, I'll just have them over for dinner. And, you know, they're, they're taking their first bite of soup. And you're like, have you repented of that sin yet? <laughs> And then they're gonna, you're going to sit around and stare at each other for the rest of it. You're going to play Settles of Catan while you call them to repent? That's a, it's a board game if you didn't know what that was. It, no, you don't have fellowship in that kind of way. And, and you come, they come to a church function. And they just want to hang out and enjoy the church and enjoy the fun. Maybe it's a wedding or a, or a baptism. And you say, you know, we've, it's been made evident that, that you have sinned in this way. Have you repented yet? If you haven't, I'll call you to repent. I mean, can you imagine how uncomfortable that would be? for that person, and yet that's what we're called to do. That's how serious this step is. Guys, read the Bible. That's what it says. Do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Why won't my Christian friends talk to me anymore? Why do they keep calling me to repent? And you do this step, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, just, I'm afraid I've rarely seen it responded to well. You're ostracizing me. You're shaming me. You're, you're yes, in that sense, not, not me, but this is what the Bible says I need to do. I am doing that. Because it's shameful for you to continue. Well, who are you? No one in particular, except a member of the body of Christ that's called to do this, and I have to deal with my own sin, and I understand those things, but you're not removed from that responsibility. Do you see why the church has to be mature? Do you see why you have to be dealing with your own sin? You're caught up in rampant sin, and you're going to talk to someone, and they know it? Yeah, the church called out your sin. And they're like, well, where's the church discipline on you? Why aren't they doing that? Now, again, it's not an excuse. But if you haven't been repenting of your sin and dealing with your sin, you've got little to say to that sinning church member. This is a powerful, powerful thing, and it's not a step to be taken lightly. Don't associate with him. And yet, don't regard him as an enemy. You're admonishing him as a brother. Please, you, you say that you're a believer. I believe you're a believer. That's what you said. And so I'm calling you can repent. You have the capacity of the Spirit of God and the power of God, and you have, my, you have our weightiness brought to bear on you. Repent. No specific time frame here. Notice there appears to be a period of time involved there. It's not just one shot. You tell the church one time they ask. No, the church is being brought to bear. So a bunch of people interacting with that person all throughout the time. So who knows how long it, it could be. Well, again, sometimes this goes pretty fast. But more often it tends to be slow. Well, if they don't, then you have step four. If they don't respond, then there's step four back in Matthew 18. If he refuses to listen even to the church, that's why we know they're being called as witnesses and as, as, as those who exhort to repentance. He says that they won't listen even to the church. Notice there's an emphasis here in the Greek and, and then it's, it's reflected in the English here. Even to the church. That is the idea that someone would continue to sin when the whole body of believers is coming against him, urging him to repent. That's a pretty strong, defiant, rebellious response. And one or two is one thing. And one person, two or three, I'm not responding to you. The whole church, 300 people, or 100 or 200 or 1,000, saying, you need to repent. What arrogance there. Well, I didn't sin. But you, again, don't you understand? That's why you go through this process. That's why he has to be so careful. It's a real sin. It's actually, you, you know that it is one. You can't just think this is, or maybe it is. Because now, if we, when it gets to the point where we're calling the whole congregation, the leadership and then the congregation had better be sure that that was actually a sin. Because if that person isn't responding, what are they always going to be telling you? They're wrong. It wasn't a sin. They've got it wrong. You're misunderstanding me. There's got to be a serious trust in the leadership. 
that they got that right, that they worked it through, that they're presenting it in a proper way. Because that person is usually going to be very eloquent about why they're not going to repent. And it's most often because I didn't actually sin. And sometimes just I'm going to keep sinning this blatant thing. That's why this has to be very carefully done, a very clear sin. But then it says, if he refuses to listen even to them, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What? Now again, remember, this, this is not, these are not ethnic slurs or, or, or coming against some particular group of people that, that you know, Jesus is slandering. Gentile here is just used in its really its spiritual sense. That is, spiritual Gentile, someone who refuses to respond to God. It, now, a Gentile is any, any non-Jew. But in general, what were non-Jews characterized by? Refusal to respond to God. And they wouldn't respond to him in unbelief and rebellion. Additionally, they were excluded from the worship of the temple. And from the direct worship, Gentiles couldn't go in. So I think that's implied here as well. They're being excluded from the assembly now of the church, represented, though, by what was going on in, in, in even before that. They couldn't even come into the temple and worship God. They're going to be excluded from that worship. Gentiles, those who are acting in unbelief and rebellion. Jesus uses it in this way in Matthew 6. He says, when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. That they can't even pray rightly. And he's referring to them as a... As a group of people as, as an ethnic group, but really the spiritual condition is what's involved underneath this. And then he says, so, so a Gentile would be a pagan, acting like a pagan, rebellious unbeliever. That's, that's who you're going to call this former brother. You're going to say, look, this is what you're acting like. Next he says, and a tax collector, that is an outcast, one who was really, uh, in one sense, the poster boy for the worst kinds of sins that you could commit. And this would have been Jews. So you've got Gentiles, non-Jews who were rebellious against God, and now you have a Jew who has abandoned his own heritage. By definition, they were cheating and lying and stealing from the people. And so Jesus is using them in that category, saying that's how you're going to treat this person as someone who's abandoned God, who, who is rebellious against God, and who's living a life of wanton sin. That's how you're going to treat this person. Jesus uses tax collector in this way in Matthew 5.46. He says, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? You see, they're kind of the epitome of those who just love the people that can be beneficial to them. So it's used as a category, a spiritual category. He's not slandering people. And remember that Jesus hung out with tax collectors and sinners. But he hung out with them for the purpose of what? That they might repent. Do not buy into this worldly thing in the church where Jesus hung out with tax collectors and sinners and, and just was having a good time and high-fiving them and having a good time. Jesus was calling them to repent. That's what you're going to do with this person now. You're calling him to repent. You're treating him like a, a pagan unbeliever, rebellious against God. Jesus never changed his opinion of the spiritual condition of tax collectors and Gentiles. He just loved them to the point of repentance and called upon them at every place and every point to repent. And that's what we're doing. This is a powerful condemnation. Those who have claimed to love Jesus, to be set free from sin, and welcomed into the assembly of believers are now set outside that assembly and declared to be, again, as far as the church's judgment, which, by the way, reflects then the judgment of God himself in heaven. And that's next week. That's what it means to loose and to bind and that that's already happened in heaven. This is reflective of the judgment of God himself concerning this sin. And whereas they were in the, the fellowship of believers, they're now being declared by the church and, and therefore bringing the weightiness of God himself that they are acting like, if not, unbelievers. Wow. All because they will not repent when confronted with sin. Why? Because believers repent. Always. That's what they are called to do. Now, it might take a while. It might take this process. You're working it through. Believers repent. If someone doesn't, what are they acting like? An unbeliever. And so the church is really making that declaration. You are acting like an unbeliever. Again, we don't know that for sure, but setting them outside the church is going to be the means that either demonstrate, they never come back in, so they were demonstrated to be an unbeliever. Or they will repent as a believer and come back to the church, and they're won back. Or they'll repent as an unbeliever, Recognizing what they had and now realizing, whoa, I didn't realize how serious this was. I didn't realize that this was the real thing because I was faking it in the church and they stuck me out. They smelled me out. They knew that I was an unbeliever and they put me out because all unbelievers live lifestyles of unrepentant sin. All unbelievers, they, don't have any, they can't do anything else because they can't repent of sin. So there's this public censure before the church. Here's how this works. If you're going to do step four, it's implied here. You've got to tell the church, right? 
He doesn't listen even to the church. You wouldn't just release him without letting the church know that that was what was going on. Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians 5. Now turn there. 1 Corinthians 5, an actual evidence or time of church discipline in the New Testament. So Paul says this, In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one. This is a man who committed incest, probably sleeping with his his. Uh, father's wife, probably not his birth mother, but possibly. But nonetheless, he's sleeping with his father's wife. And I was in spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, I decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So Paul says, look, gather the church. I'm not even there, but your leadership is not doing what they're supposed to do. You haven't done what you're supposed to do. So now as the shepherd, by, by proxy, as, as the apostle of this church, I'm taking the authority to say, this person is out. And he's not asking the congregation. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do. He's not saying, let's vote about this and see if you're going to do this, see if we'll follow the will of the leadership. He's saying, look, this has already been determined. This is clear, it's evident, and I'm putting them out. Gather the whole congregation and tell them. Don't ask them. Because how would they know? They haven't worked through the process. You can't ask the congregation if you should do church discipline because they're not, they haven't worked all the way through. They don't know the whole process. So he's then removed from the church. Now, some fascinating statements Paul uses. says, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh and then so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. First, let's talk about this removal. Why remove him from the church? Because the church cannot harbor sin or associate with those who claim to be believers who don't repent. The church exists within a fallen world. It must be able to live and work in the world of unbelievers. In fact, we're commanded to associate with unbelievers, to minister, to, to, to witness, to evangelize them. However, the church is and must be made up of believers who are not dominated by sins that they don't repent of. And thus our associations are not to be characterized by the sins of the world. The church is to be different. If it's not, there's a problem. 1 Corinthians 5, just drop your eyes down. Because they were confused about this. Paul had written them, look, you can't associate with immoral people. And they thought, well, are you telling us we can't associate with the world? Okay, they weren't removing the immorality in their midst. And they were saying, well, we'll just draw back from the world because those are evil people out there. When they were coddling sin in their own midst. And you see, the world hates this about the church. Let me read the verses before I... Go on my soapbox. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world that by de facto, by definition, if you're an unbeliever, you live immorally. Not doing all the sin you can. Don't misunderstand me. An immoral lifestyle is not to believe in Jesus. Not to bend the knee to to be rebellious against God. Not at all the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers, idolaters. So then you would have to go out of the world that's what the world is full of. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person or covetous or idolater or reviler or a drunkard or a swindler. A lot of different sins. Sins of the heart, idolater. A lot of things covered there. Again, it'd have to be clear. You'd have to know this. It'd have to have manifestations. But nonetheless, don't associate with that kind of person. Why? Not even to eat with such a one. No, no fellowship extended in that way. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. See, when the church trumpets the, the evils of society, talking about homosexuality is evil and transgenderism is wrong, and it is evil and it is wrong, and, and the world is doing all these sins, the world looks back at the church and goes, you coddle adultery, you coddle bitterness, you coddle self-righteousness, you coddle anger. You say, all those things are fine. You're going to try to call us out on our sins. Get your own house right. And they're right. The world are, they are unbelievers. I'm not saying we, wouldn't, we don't stand for the fact that you don't commit those sins. But the first place we look that those sins are not to be committed is in our own midst. And the only way that unbelievers are going to stop committing their sins is not when we call them out and say, stop that bad thing. But we proclaim to them the truth of Jesus, the nature of their sin, and call them to repent. And then we are actively repenting and that that is evident to the world because they watch us put people out of our midst who don't repent. Do you see how powerful this is? Do you see how essential this is? If the church is not going to get called self-righteous and and the world be right, if we're not going to get called holier than thou who just call everyone else out and then in our own self-righteousness move on, church discipline has to be done. It reveals the reality of the righteousness of Christ and the the purity that the church is called to, that Jesus died for, when the church will say, we will not put up with unrepentant sin, that person is out. 
pretty challenging to the world because now we're saying that person is just like them now and they can't come in. It's challenging all the way around. How about 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14? Do not be bound together with unbelievers. I had the privilege of officiating Jonathan and Laura, now Goggin's marriage, yesterday. What a beautiful thing, two believers coming together. But this is not a marriage verse. Don't be bound together with unbelievers. You shouldn't marry an unbeliever. But this is all about the church. This is all about the body of believers when it says, don't be bound together with unbelievers. What partnership of righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship is light with darkness? What harmony is Christ with Belial? What is a believer in common with an unbeliever? Nothing. Your purpose is different. Your heart is different. Your nature is different. Your desires are different. Your end result is different. Your eternity is different. Everything. What agreement is the temple of God with idols? For we're the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch what is unclean and I will welcome you. We've come out from the world. And if someone in our church is acting like the world, we set them out back into that because we've come out of it. It's essential that the church do this. Now, again, that means that we love each other. That means that we have this, this communion together, this fellowship together, so that we even know when people are sinning again, we know what's right and good, and we love each other well enough that then when someone isn't doing that, we have to set them outside. Imagine a church where everybody is sinning against each other, there's no fellowship, there's nothing great, and you set someone outside of it. That person's probably like, thanks for releasing me from that. Glad I, glad I could get out of that. But no, if we're tightening it close, loving one another, you set someone outside the church and it's devastating. It's the very thing that Paul says. I'm delivering them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. Now see, the church doesn't kill people. It turns them over to Satan, who then, they don't have the protection of the church's teaching, the church's fellowship, the church's friendship, the church's ministries, the Spirit of God working in a powerful way through corporate worship and corporate gathering. They lose, lose all of that. They come directly under the guns of Satan himself. You see, it's only because we don't properly appreciate the protection, guarding, and benefit of the local church that we don't understand the weightiness of being put outside it. In fact, so many people in this day and age just leave the local church and just hang out doing whatever. Christians. And Satan is ravaging their life and they don't even understand the difference because they've never participated in the body of Christ in such a way that they see its blessings and its protection. What a shame. What a shame. So church discipline is weightless to someone who does not understand the importance of being involved in a local church and the protection that that provides. But I watch this happen all the time. People walk out of a church and then they don't go to another good, godly church because we're not the only church that's good and godly. But they don't do it. They don't, they don't connect anywhere. And they don't think Satan's ravaging their life because we live in America. And they're rich and they have all they need and their families are generally good oftentimes. They don't understand the spiritual decay that's happening. That Really, they're, they're being destroyed and they're, they're being harmed and they're not ministering for the body and they're not caring for believers. They don't even know it. It should be the worst thing in the world ever to be put outside of a recognized godly church. And it is the worst thing ever. Delivered to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. That, is, that he would take everything, as it were. And that's what Paul is hoping, that it would become so clear that they're now under the attacks of Satan that they would repent so they get back into the church. And he says, but again, it's for restoration, so they will be saved, back in 1 Corinthians 5, so they'll be saved on the day of judgment, on the day of our Lord Jesus. It's not to, well, that'll show them. No, it's so they will recognize they're sinners, either unbelievers or sinning believers. A church that doesn't do church discipline coddles and really promotes apostasy. That is, people can come in the church, think they're believers, they never get set outside the church, so they're like, if this is what believers are like, I'm in. And they stand before God on the day of judgment, and he says, depart from me, and the church really was at fault. We didn't have enough strength or wisdom or holiness to recognize sin in our midst and to set it outside, and we essentially condemn that person to eternal hell because we never told them, you're an unbeliever. I understand God's sovereignty and salvation, I understand all that, but we have a, resp a sovereign responsibility. A church that does not do this promotes the apostasy of many and thus the eternal death of many. And unfortunately, that's many churches in our day and age. So this is necessary. You do at some point call someone an unbeliever, but you only do that so they can properly recognize that they need to run to Christ. And again, this, this, this is a believer. He'll recognize his need to repent. And sometimes it's really hard to tell which was it. And they'll tell you, they'll come back to the church. I'm not sure. Some will say, I wasn't unbeliever. I, I was unbelieving. Some will say, no, I was a believer and the weightiness was on me but I've got it. So they're treated as an unbeliever. Why? For restoration. That they will be one and saved from the wrath to come. So what does church discipline accomplish just as we finish out? This, this isn't on your outline, but as a summary then, 
When you do this, you go all the way through step four, what does it actually accomplish? This fourth step provides the best opportunity for the restoration of a sinning brother. Don't get in the way of the discipline of God. Don't think that somehow you're going to coddle that person. If you set them outside, they're going to get really mad and they won't come to church. That's the whole point. And, and that they should recognize, whoa, this is different. And so it's the best possible opportunity. It's the best loving thing you could do is to set them outside the church so they won't spend eternity in hell because they haven't recognized their lack of repentance. Next, it protects the purity of the church itself. If this sin is going on, it's like a cancer. This person is sinning. They're not repenting. It's what? It's tempting others to sin. What our whole chapter is about. Be better to have a millstone put around your neck than do that. And so you don't want this person continuing to sin. It destroys the purity of the church. So when you put them out, it protects the purity. Three, it presents an example of Christ's power and purity to those outside the church. Like these people really mean this. They understand that, that this Savior they claim actually has, has some authority over them. And they can't just do whatever they want. They can't just go show up at church on Sunday. It removes their claim of hypocrisy. Where's a bunch of hypocrites who can't ever deal with sin? We do. It brings a fear and awe of God to those inside and outside the church. And Acts chapter 5, when there's a church discipline, right at the beginning of the church is starting, it's God who does it. It's Ananias and Sapphira again. They lie. The church didn't know that, but the Holy Spirit did because he's God and he, he knew their hearts. He was resident there. And they come before Peter and Peter says, why do you lie to the Holy Spirit? Why do you lie to God? And God takes the discipline right then and, and does it fully. He, what? He, he takes them home or he kills them and they spend eternity in hell. I'm not sure which, it's hard to know. But nonetheless, he does that. Guys, again, we, we don't kill, that's what God does. We set them outside for what's a very similar picture though, the destruction of their flesh. We, we want them to go all the way, as po- far as possible, so they don't spend eternity in hell. But when that happened, it wasn't like everybody left the church because like, that's mean. How can God do that? It says in Acts 5.11, great fear came over the whole church. It's like, People are serious. The church itself is like, woo. Sin needs to be dealt with. Because there's a lot of liars, I guarantee you, in the church at Jerusalem that weren't named Ananias and Sapphira. What do you think they thought when Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead and Peter announces this? I'd better stop lying because the Spirit knows my heart. This is a serious thing. And it says, those, it says, and over all who heard these things, the outside world watching along with him is going, I can't believe that just happened. I can't believe that the holiness and the standard that God asks for in his church. And I'll bet you some of them came to Christ. And that happens. We've done church this one, I think I said five or six times here. Every time there is testimony from outsiders to say, oh, you're serious about that. And from insiders to say, wow, th- I mean, we're serious about sin. Because we're serious about loving God and pursuing Jesus and all the positive things that come have to do with the church. But because we're serious about that, we're serious about sin so that our holy God will be honored. Just a couple of thoughts. Do you appreciate the value and protection that the local church is providing you? Do you appreciate it enough to stop sinning or to repent when you are confronted in sin? Do you realize what it would be to be set outside the, the boundary of a, of a, of a God-honoring, Christ-fearing, Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church. Do you even know? Deal with your sin. The church, and be part of the church in every aspect because it's keeping you from being hardened by sin, Hebrews 3.12. Are you consumed with the purity, unity, and maturity of the church and thus willing to do whatever it takes to promote them? Can I just ask you to do something? Stop railing against the sins that are out there. Stop having sleepless nights because our president doesn't do this or our, you know, the Democratic committee doesn't do this or, or unbelievers don't do this. Why should that cause you sleepless nights? That's what they do. What should cause you sleepless nights is that there might be sin here and that your own sin might be promoting sin in this church. It should cause you to lay awake at night and to ask God's forgiveness. Turn off the TV. Be done with the, with the talk radio about how worried you are about all those other things. Let's do some housekeeping. Let's do some personal work. That should worry you. That should bother you. There's other things, guys, that just happens. A strong, godly church can weather anything a government will throw at it. I'm not saying I, I, I relish that. I'm not saying that. I don't want to live in North Korea. I mean that seriously. But nonetheless, a strong, godly church can deal with what it needs to deal with. But a weak, powerless, unholy church will crumble and fail. And lastly, are you willing to go to others to call them to repentance? to remove yourself from those who do not repent. 
and to reconcile and forgive those who do. This is a powerful call. It's time for us to take stock. It's not that, it's not that I don't think you are. I'm, this is not beat the church day. Because I love you. I know you're doing this. I'm only saying this is weighty. God is giving us this wake up. I didn't make up the passage. I didn't make the weightiness of it. So we need to take it in a weighty fashion, all of us, wherever you may be on the spectrum here, so that our church will be holy and pure. I'm not talking about other churches. I'm talking about our church. That we would honor the Lord. Father, thank you for this powerful reminder, this challenge that we would see sin removed from our midst and go even so far as to set people outside to, to, to shame them because of the shame of dishonoring and displeasing you, our holy God. Lord, I pray that in, in the positive sense, we would constantly be building each other up, constantly encouraging that our fellowship would be strong, that we would even be able to recognize sin and that it would matter if we weren't part of this local body of believers. Lord, help us to be to the world a shining evidence of the power and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ and of you, our precious Holy Father. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed.